That is what we are about. Amen. We are about changing our culture. Praise God. Becoming a culture of connect, grow, serve, and go. We have a vision and a mission here at Hope City Church, and we want to live that out loud, right? We want to connect with God. We want to connect with people that don't know God. We want to grow in our faith every single day. Amen. We want to serve God, and then we want to go. We want to put what we know on our feet, into our feet, right? And go out there and introduce people to Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Amen. As you're standing, why don't you grab your Bibles, and we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 6. While you're doing that, while you're grabbing your smartphone or your tablet or your Bible, I want to ask how many of you have already enjoyed the, the sermon, Currency of Eternity? Wow. If you haven't listened to that or watched that, you want to get to it right away. I think there's something very important about being unified together and doing something together as a body of believers. Um, we are currency. I really enjoyed that sermon. I'm going to listen to it over and over and over again. Our flesh might not like that kind of message, but that's exactly what our flesh needs, right? I want to burn out for God, right? I want to be a flame that burns for Christ's sake. Amen. I want to, I want to burn out for his, amen, for his glory. Amen. So listen to that again if you've listened to it now. I did say that we we're going to try to be motivated. We're going to try to uh, continue to use the tools that Brother Morgans gave us. And one of those other tools was the Irvin Baxter, the salvation package. How many of you got that? If you did not get that and you want that, you need to see Crystal. And there she is. You need to see Crystal. Not just see her, but go up to her and ask her uh, if you can get a copy of the four uh, DVDs of the Salvation Package. And you're going to want to watch that. You're going to want to watch it. I think that there needs to be maybe a, a Hope City initiative. And this is it. Turn off the Wi-Fi in your house. <laughs> now, if you're using the Wi-Fi to watch the currency of revival or uh, grow spiritually, that's one thing. But maybe we need to turn, pick a night during the week and just turn off our Wi-Fi so we're disconnected from all the things of our to our flesh and put in the salvation package and grow from what Brother Baxter, Irvin Baxter says. It is good stuff. I'm in the middle of watching that myself, and I think you'll enjoy it. Amen? Two more things I want to say before we read the word. It's very important that you catch what I'm about to say. If our lives are not drawing closer to God, if you and I are not drawing closer to God, if you and I are not seeing victory in our attitude, if we're not seeing victory in our marriages, if we're not seeing victory as a witness, then I am declaring that we are doing something wrong. You can't love God right. You can't read the word right. You can't open your heart to God and not see victory in your life, right? It's impossible. It is impossible because prayer changes things. A relationship with God will change your marriage. A relationship with God will change your finances. A relationship with God will change your attitude. It will. Amen. I've seen, I've seen too many lives changed to stand up before you and tell you it doesn't work. Amen. I'll tell you what. I'll give you one name. I'll give you one name right now that is a declaration of how God does great things in people's lives when they totally surrender over to them. And that name is May Vallis. Yeah, you can look at May Vallis and you can see God working in her life. She has fallen in love with Jesus. She has fallen in love with her church and she's doing great things for God. She's not the only one, but she comes to my, to my mind and my heart today. Amen. Not a new believer, but she's not been with us too, too long. And it's great to see what God's doing in her life. Amen. 
God changes things. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. I want to again thank everyone that was involved with my wife's birthday party celebration last night. Thank you, thank you from the bottom of our heart. We appreciate your love, your loyalty, and your kindness to us, and, and your presence. We appreciate your presence, not your presence as in gifts, but your presence at the party. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1. The Bible says, Take heed that you do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Sadly, this isn't done right in the church a lot of times. Verse 2 says, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand Doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. I need more monitor, not sanctuary speakers, platform speakers. And when thou prayest, that thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions, right? Saying the same prayer over and over again. God said, don't do that. Right, we don't want to get in a rut. But it said, when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. Amen. I'm going I'm to take a roundabout way today using this passage get across a very, very important point today. Can you put your Bibles down? I know it's a very different scripture to read on a Sunday morning. Just bear with me and I'm hoping that we can circle back around to the point that I feel that God wants me to make today. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the people of God today, those that have separated themselves out on a Sunday morning, that God, they have made it a priority to come to the house of God. The Bible says that we're to gather together much the more as we see that day approaching. And certainly, God, that day, that day, whatever that day is, and when it's coming, God, we can see the signs of the times. And I pray that, God, that you would do a miracle of work in every mind and every heart today. Let us not be deceived in these last days, God. Let us not be deceived. The signs are all around us, Lord. I pray that we can be awakened Lord, to what you want us to be awakened to and see and do the things that, God, we must do to be obedient servants of, of you, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Help us to receive the word. Help me to bring it forth in the name of Jesus Christ. Everyone said in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you shake a hand next to you? Wave at somebody. Fist bump somebody. Tell somebody you appreciate them and love them. Amen. As you've heard me say many, many times, you and I, the Christians, true, genuine Christians, ought to be the friendliest people on the face of the earth. Amen. People ought to be safe around about us. They ought to feel secure around us. Amen. Praise God. I'd like to entitle my thoughts this morning, Closet Time. Closet Time. I have a twofold purpose. I feel that God is asking me, to convey to the church today something that has a twofold purpose. First, giving to God, giving God 
what is his from our finances and from our service, our works, our good deeds is something that you and I should do faithfully unto the Lord. As we know, there are Old Testament scriptures that declare that we ought to not rob God with our tithe and offering. And the Bible in the New Testament says that we ought to do these things. We, we should do these certain things. We should give God what is his without forgetting to uh, do the other things that are important to us. The Bible says to him is given much is required. There is great sacrifice that God asks from you and I. We understand that everything that I have belongs to God. Everything that I have, all of my money is God's. All of it, everything that I am belongs to him. He, but he doesn't ask for everything. He only asks for a, a, a little percentage back. And it's amazing how when you and I give 10% or 15%, we give our tithe and then we give an offering unto God. When we give that, it's amazing how 80%, 85% can go much farther than 100%. Don't ask me how it works, but it does. Don't ask me how my cell phone works. I don't get it. Don't, 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 I, you can text me from across the entire world and I can, I can receive a message from you. I don't understand it. I'm sure somebody could explain it. I don't understand, you know, the radio waves and things that are in the air right now. There's words and messages and, and things that are in the air. I don't get that kind of stuff, but that's okay. I may not understand it, but it exists. And so we understand, spiritual people understand how giving to God works. When we give to God our tithe and our offering, how when we give to God, he said, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Amen. That we are to be stewards of our time, our talents, and our treasure. Amen. Secondly, and most importantly, we do not do either of these, and these either are giving financially and giving of our service, our works, and our good deeds. We do not do either of them to be seen by people. We don't, we don't do these things for others. As John mentioned, that's the kind of culture we want to change, you know? The Bible says, when it talks about giving financially, we don't blow a trumpet, right? We don't, you know, we don't, we don't get our taxes or, or we don't get our paycheck and we are bringing our, our, our tithe and our offering to church and, and we walk in the door and we've hired a parade, you know? We've hired people, actors, to come to church with us and here we bring our, our paycheck to, to the Lord and say, God, here's what yours and, you know, there's dun, dun, da, 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 and, and there's a parade of people following us and, and going, oh, hooray, hooray, the Doucettes are giving their finances today. That, that, that rhymed. We don't do that. Even though we are to give of our finances because we are to be stewards and we are to give our time and our talents, we are to give good works and good deeds to the Lord. The point here is we do not do that to be seen of man. We are not to be doing it for a congratulations, right? We are not to be doing it to say, well, you're one of the biggest givers of the church. Hurrah, wow, how amazing. We don't, we don't give financially for any type of accolade. We don't give financially for any pat on the back, nor do we stand as a greeter or we work as a sound man or we oversee and teach in first steps. We don't do any of that. For a congratulations, well done. No, we don't do any of that for any praise here on this earth. For the scripture, and we've read it, if you do it for that, then that's all that you get. You do get that pat on the back. You do get the clapping of the hand, and you get, you get people to look at you and say, wow, you are amazing. But the Bible says that's your reward then, if you do it to be seen of man. In light of our scripture text, you got to understand when you're putting messages together and you're opening your heart and your mind to God and saying, God, you know, what do you want me to present to the people of God today? In light of our scriptural text, my mind went back to one story in particular of a man of great faith in the Old Testament 
A man, the Bible says, was called a friend of God. In the book of James, chapter 2, James chapter 2 and verse 23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God. It says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Oh my goodness, there could be great things that could be said of any one of us. I'm telling you, one of the most faithful people I know is Bevan Aston. Amen. She used to babysit me and spank me with wooden spoons. And yet she is in the house of God today. She loves God and she's faithful to God. There's something to be said of a faithful saint of God. I think that concludes... Look around here who spanked me um, in the house of God. Bonnie is not here. And certainly Bonnie's hand would be raising that she spanked me. But goodness gracious, how awesome it would be to be an Abraham, right? Where the Bible uh, uh, speaks his name. And there is a scripture in the Bible that says that Abraham believed God. Oh, how our generation, oh, how this generation needs to be more like Abraham. Oh, how you and I need to work so dedicately, uh, amen, and steadfastly uh, to be more like an Abraham. Uh, if I could be said that I am a friend of God. What an amazing thing. Abraham, the one called the father of the faithful, one of the forefathers of Israel, a man that all of us here could emulate an example our lives after. He believed God. He, he believed God. How, how awesome that is that he believed in a God that he could not see. Oh, I'm sure that he could have he felt God, but he believed in a God that he could not see. Surely visited by, you know, visited by the represents, representation of God. Abraham had a relationship with him. But you see, focusing here, to stay on point this morning, focusing on one particular moment in his life. If you know anything about the story of Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they were unable to have children. Abraham was promised to be the father of many nations, the Bible says. Yet his wife was barren. She could not have children. They waited 25 long years holding on to this one promise of God. And Abraham, the Bible says he was 100 years old and Sarah was 90 years old. But God promised them that they would have a child. And that promise came to pass as all of God's promises do. Church, if God promised you, it's going to come to pass. My God is a God of his word. When he promises you something, it will come to pass. They were blessed with a baby boy, and they named that little boy Isaac. The word Isaac, the name Isaac means laughter. One who laughs or one who rejoices. They were laughing. They were rejoicing. They were celebrating of the goodness of God. I know today there are people here under the sound of my voice that you have something to rejoice about. You have something to laugh about. You have something to be excited about today. Don't let the enemy steal your laughter. Don't let the enemy steal your rejoicing. Don't let the enemy... Take away what belongs to you. Don't let the enemy speak lies into your heart and into your mind. Do not let it. God's promises do come true. But you see this one particular moment in Abraham's life. After Isaac, his, his only son, his promised seed, he grew up and he became a man. God asked of Abraham something that no one could ever explain. Very difficult to understand, right? You know where I'm going. It's very difficult to understand. God commanded Abraham to give an extraordinary offering. Yes, I've been talking. I started off by reading a scripture about how those that give alms, those that give financially to God, that's an offering. That is a tithe. When you give something to God, when you give that to God, God sees it. Not too long ago, I preached about that, that little widow that gave her a little mite, right? Jesus was telling the story. And so the point I made in that message is if Jesus was telling the story, he's watching what you and I give and what you and I do not give. 
He made her an example, thank God, that she was a good example for him to testify of. He, he made the same a, a declaration that, that she gave more than, than the rich people gave because they gave much less because of what they had. And she gave all that she had. <laughs> for some of you that struggle with tithes and offering, how beautiful is it that even though your very life comes from God, your very life, the breath in your body comes from God and your, in your finances. Everything that you are is because of God's blessing. But God doesn't demand everything back. He just asks you to trust him, amen, to give him his 10% and to give an offering unto the Lord. Yeah, I'm talking about financial offering on this Sunday morning, but I'm not only talking about finances, I'm talking about your life. I'm, I'm talking about the currency of eternity, right? I'm talking about the good deeds and the works that we must do to fulfill God's perfect plan in my life. This man Isaac grew up, and God asked of Abraham an extraordinary offering. God told Abraham, take your son, your only son Isaac. It's interesting to me. He had another son, but God didn't recognize that other son. He recognized the promise. Hear me. He recognized the promised son, the promised seed, Isaac. He said, whom you love and go to Moriah and offer him there to me as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I declare of you. I can't wrap my mind around this, right? I mean, here... God promised him a, he promised him a son. You can't have, you can't be the father of many nations without a, a son. You, 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 can't, you can't do that. You can't fulfill the, the, the plan of God. And, and for years, Sarah was barren. They couldn't have children. Up to 100 years old, Abraham and Sarah was 90 years old. How in the world were they going to produce a child from, from, from those, those, those loins with cobwebs and such, Right? I mean, but, but God promised. But God promised. And see, God is a God of promises. He fulfills his promises. And, and church, hear me. This message is for every living individual alive here on this earth. Hear me. God asked an extraordinary offering. Church, I want to declare something. This book called the Bible, it's not a book of fables. Come on, the Bible is not a book of fables. This is not fictional. No, this is the word of God, the very words of God. And they declare the truth. Amen. The Bible declares the very truth. Amen. Today, for time and eternity. I'm here to tell somebody, you've been holding on to a promise. Uh, there's been things that you've been, you, 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 you've been asking God for, uh, and he spoke to you many years ago, and he said that he would do it. Uh, I'm here to tell somebody, you hold uh, on to the promises of God. Uh, you hold on to his promise, because my God is not a liar. He is faithful. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. You've heard me say it before. I've preached this many times. Amen. The word of God that's written wasn't, wasn't uh, uh, from, uh, you know, uh, 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 a bad gyro sandwich. It wasn't from a spicy, you know, uh, uh, a spicy burrito. Uh, amen. That all of a sudden one of the uh, writers of the Bible began to uh, just write things down. No, my friend, the Bible says all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. God inspired man to write the word of God. And you and I need to to hold God's word, amen, precious. We need to hold God's word to our bosom and believe it. He said it's not only, he said it's profitable for doctrine. You can stand upon the word of God because it's true. He said it is for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. He says this, verse 17, he says what? Why do we want to hold this word so close to our hearts? It says that the man of God, that the woman of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. That's why I began this message today with if, 
if your life now don't don't misinterpret me i'm not saying that once you give your life to jesus that your life is going to be a bed of roses that's what i'm saying i'm not saying that you're not going to have hard days i'm not saying that you're going to not have battles to fight but you see in all the in all the hardship and all the toil and all the pain you and i as the people of god the bible says we are not supposed to worry about tomorrow we're not supposed to fret we're not supposed to have anxiety we're not supposed to fear we're supposed to put our faith and our trust in God. We are supposed to walk with total dependence upon the Lord. I could be facing a giant like David did, amen, but what I have to do like David did is I got to walk that walk by that brook. I got to find five smooth stones. I just got to put my faith in God, amen. You come before me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you, amen, with the name of the Lord of hosts, amen. David didn't have a sword. David didn't have, amen, the, the, the tools to fight the giant, but what he did have is a relationship with God. And you and I are fighting, we're fighting giants in our life too. We are fighting, and help me understand, hear me, all the stuff that we're going through, amen, all the stuff that you and I are facing right now, amen, there has never been a time in your life and my life that we need a closet, that you and I need a place to go, that we close the door behind us and we get alone with God and we begin to talk to him about everything that's going on in our life. We need to have a closet. You and I need a closet to have closet time to get alone with God. Something equal and as profound as God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son unto the Lord as an offering. Something as equal was that Abraham obediently took his boy on that long journey to the mountain and did just that, Tom. Just as equal, as confounding, really, as amazing, as wow, oh my goodness, God is asking me to sacrifice my son, my only son Isaac, before the Lord as a burnt offering. That is crazy and wild, but just as crazy and wild. You have an Abraham. You have an Abraham that without question, amen, the Bible says that he got his donkeys and his horses. He, he, he took his son and he went on the trip and did exactly what God told him to do. convicting to me it's convicting to me it pricks me in my heart it pricks me in my heart because we can't even turn off the wi-fi for a night we 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 can't even disconnect from things that we know that are pulling us away from god's call on our life we we, we can't build the right relationships that we need we're struggling financially we're, 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 we're tormented with fear and anxiety and we wonder we wonder what's going on i'm here to tell you the answer is in closet time the answer is in a relationship with jesus christ oh how the church today needs more men and women like Abraham. Oh, how God is looking and needing men and women today to believe in him like they did in the Bible times. Oh, God, help me to remove self. Help me to remove my, remove my flesh, my disbelief, my lack of faith. Help me to possess un wavering trust in God help me God to have an unwavering trust in you amen God doesn't even ask hear me church God doesn't even ask much of us he doesn't ask very much of you and I he's never asked any one of us to go kill your son I know that we're living in different times. I understand that. Amen. But some things that God has asked of us, some of us in here are saying, no way. That's too hard, God. There's no way that I could give that up. There's no way I could surrender that to you, God. Hear me. How can you compare what God is asking you to give up to what God asked Abraham to do? It kind of changes things a little bit, doesn't it? 
It kind of brings things into perspective. But how beautiful the story is. All scripture is given by inspiration. What it inspires me to do. I want that same kind of relationship that Abraham had with God. I don't know about you, but I want that kind of relationship where I trust God. Where I'm obedient immediately. And I say, okay God, it's not about me, it's about you. It's about you, God. The church needs the church needs to be filled with more friends of God. The church needs to be filled with more friends of God. Where God, if he were to write the book all over again, would any of our names be in it? Would your name make it? Would my name make it that says, hey, they're a friend of mine? Abraham did not comprehend God's purpose. Sometimes you and I are not going to understand God's purpose in our life. We're not going to understand why we're going through what we're going through. We're, we're, we, our, our finite mind, we can't wrap our mind around it. We can't wrap our mind. Hear me. It, it, it's best that we don't know God's will. We don't, it's best we don't know from the end, from the beginning. Because, hey, hear me, you and I have said it before, we would never appreciate the mountaintops if we never had the valley lows. Hear me, somebody, if you're going to make it, you've got to have some closet time. You've got to have relationship with God. You've got to turn off the Wi-Fi. You've got to take things into your hands and make them happen. I want to be called a friend of God. Yeah. Abraham didn't comprehend God's purpose. Yet he trusted God. He put his faith in God. His faith was not shaken. Hear me. God's not asking any of us in here to do anything that we cannot do, right? Abraham complied with God with every instruction and placed his son on the altar. You read the scripture yourself. He raised his knife, the Bible said. He raised the knife over his head to plunge it into the chest of his son. And at that very moment when Abraham lifted up the knife to slay his son, God stopped him. The Bible says a voice of an angel came out of heaven. In, in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 11 and 12. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham... Abraham, can you see this? And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know, now I know. You've got to understand something. Okay, verse 12. This is God's, God's a little bit different sometimes. I'm going to scroll my, see this? I'm scrolling my notes. Could you go back, gentlemen? Could you go back to our text in, 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 in Matthew chapter 6 and verse, in verse 9? I'm sorry, yeah, verse 8. It says, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what? Your father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask of him. So God knows everything. The Bible says God, he knows everything before we even ask. And then if we fast forward, amen, to where we are, and we see how amazing this is, we see how wonderful the scripture is, amen, how awesome it is to understand what God is trying to get us to, to, to see here. He, he, he's saying here, he said, hey! He didn't understand it completely. But he trusted God. Here's the point in verse 12, Genesis 22. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know. We just read that God knows everything before we even ask. For now I know. What was God, what, what is, what, what, how do we put the pieces of the puzzle together? Even though he knows the outcome before we do it, he still expects us to do it. He still expects us to be obedient. Does that make sense? 
The Bible already showed us that he already knows things. But now the scripture says, for now I know, he said, Abraham, now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son from me. God already knew this about Abraham. But even though God knows things about you and me, he expects us to be obedient. He expects, expects us to be obedient and to serve and to do what he asks us to do. Can you get that? I wonder if somebody's picking up what I'm putting down. Are you seeing this? Many have wondered. I have wondered. Many have wondered. Would have Abraham gone through with it? Would he have been able to actually do it? I say, yes. I, 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 I say a profound yes. And the Bible gives us the answer in Hebrews chapter 11. Verses 17 through 19. Hebrew 11. Hebrews 11, 17 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promise was offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that Isaac shall thy seed be called. Verse 19, accounting that God was able. Here was Abraham. This is what was in his heart. He says, accounting that God was able to raise him up, to raise Isaac up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Ha. You, you can take it to the bank that Abraham would have followed through. Abraham would have followed through with it. Now the correlation, I've got to hurry on. The correlation between the story of Abraham and Matthew 6 is this, and the context is very clear. The subject is giving. We're talking about giving, right? We're talking about giving and not you know, financially. We're talking about giving of our good deeds, our works. We're talking about that. But we're also talking about the focus is that we don't give. The focus is I don't serve. I don't clean bathrooms for a pat on the back. I'm not in the AVL ministry to get a trophy. I'm not here serving God on the platform. Amen to one day cut a record and get all this, all, all, all this money. No, I'm not here for that. The correlation is clear. The focus is that we don't give to be seen, nor do we do for reward here on the earth. No one, hear me, no one was, no one was anywhere nearby when Abraham and Isaac were up on that mountain. The only thing that was nearby was a ram stuck in the thicket because God's a provider. God was testing Abraham to see if, if, if he trusted him. God was testing. God's, t God's testing people right now. There are people here today that God's been testing you. He's been trying you. He's been trying to see what you're made of. Uh, amen. The Bible says that God will test you. He will not tempt you to sin, but he will test you. He will put things in your life to try you, to see if you have faith in him, that you will be obedient to him. Again, the correlation is the focus is that we don't give or serve for reward on the earth. But no one was nearby when Abraham and Isaac were up on that mountain. The offering Abraham was given, giving to God, was a private one. Not for show and certainly not for congratulations. You have great faith. The takeaway from both of these examples is something much deeper. It speaks of relationship and trust in God. It speaks of knowing that God is pleased. That God is pleased when you and I give a gift. The gift is given with regard only for his purpose, right? That I'm not giving of myself for my purpose. I'm not, do, I'm not serving for, my, for accolades, right? I'm not serving for a reward, but I'm... I'm given my private offering. For his purpose and his glory, completely devoid, completely devoid of any attention being drawn to me. We've said it so many times, it's not about me, it's not about us. It's about him. You see, Abraham walked with God. He was a friend of God. He possessed he possessed the closet that Matthew speaks of. It says, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, when you shut the door, you've got you've to shut the door to all distractions. You've got to shut the door. It's very difficult for a mom to pray, to genuinely, authentically 
connect and touch God when she's got kids running under her feet and, and there's noise and there's all kinds. It's very difficult. It's so difficult. The Bible says we've got to have a closet of prayer. We've got to find an alone time. We've got to get alone with God. We've got to get away. We've got to close out everything. It says, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut the door, Pray to thy Father which is in secret. It's that closet that we all should have as we draw closer and nearer to God every day. That closet is that closeness with God, that alone time with God when it's just him and me. When all obstacles and distractions are removed from my mind, when all of these things are removed from my heart and I can be totally focused on him and the needs I must get met. I have needs, God. I've got to, I've got to speak to God. I must bring my needs before him to get them met, to draw near to him every day. It's about connection. It's about spending time with the one I love most and becoming more and more like him every day. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18 says, But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed. This is what I'm talking about. If you're here today and you're not seeing the changing effect of God, that's a sermon right there. Somebody needs to preach that. The change effect. The changing effect. If you and I are not seeing a changing effect, amen, in our life every day, there's something wrong. You're not doing it right. You need to figure out how to do it. Uh, you need to get into a closet and shut the door and get alone with God begin to talk to him pour out your heart to him that's what it says in the Bible that's what, that's what Abraham had Abraham was a friend of God you can't be a friend and not spend any time with him you can't be a friend and not have a closet you can't be a friend and not trust your friend you can't be a friend and not be loyal you can't be a friend you can't be a friend and, and, and turn your back on them no we all need some closet time we need to turn the Wi-Fi off we all need to get to the place where we will not draw attention to ourselves anymore, one bit whatsoever. For when we are all about Jesus, when we are about the kingdom, when we're about his kingdom, we then declare that we are a steward of God rather than have the attitude of that we have ownership of anything. You see, once you and I realize that we're really not an owner of what I have, but, but I'm a steward of my time, I'm a steward of my talents. I'm a steward of my treasure. Oh, you can take the approach that you're own, you own it, but you see, you're never going to get. You're never going to get it. You're never. You're never really going to find true joy and happiness. You're never going to. The Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. People that people that fight God, people that don't obey, people that don't ever find a closet, brother John. People that don't ever that, that don't ever submit to that. You never find the peace and the joy, amen, that God has for you. Never find it. Because owners never find it, but stewards do. When you realize that you don't, it's not yours, it's not, it's not mine. I'm a steward of what God has given to me. The talents and the abilities and the personality, we all need closet time. Closet time helps us draw attention to God rather than to ourselves. I may need to teach a lesson on this in Matthew chapter 6 so that we understand, you know, the right hand, know what the left hand is doing. That means you, you can, you, you know that you can talk yourself out of a blessing? Did you know that? You can, when, when, people, are, when people are worried, oh man, oh my goodness, they're worried. You know, should I give or should I not? Uh, oh, you can wrestle, oh dear God, I don't know. Your right hand and your left hand, you need to quit worrying about it. When God says to do it, you just need to do it. Don't let your, let, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. When God tells you to do it, you just step into faith. Uh, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him. It was imputed to him for righteousness. 
That's what we need to do. Quit trying to talk your way out of a blessing. Quit trying to talk your way out of victory. Just obey God. Just trust in him. Just get in the closet of prayer and shut the door. Turn off the Wi-Fi. Remember, prayer is not just monologue. It's dialogue. Some of your marriages aren't working because you're trying to do it all yourself. You own, you own your life. You haven't yet surrendered your marriage over to God. Some of your finances, you will, the Bible says the poor, you will have with you always. Some of you in here will always be poor. Poor is a mindset. Some of you can have a lot of money and still be poor in your mind because you haven't realized that it belongs to God. Hear me, it's very important. The poor you have with you always, it's a mindset. Amen, it's an attitude. It's an approach. Uh, hear me, God does, I believe that, I believe the people of God should be the blessed people. Amen, how come, how come the people of mammon, why is it that only the people of mammon should have, why would Mr. Walmart have all the money and Bill Gates have all the money and, and Elon Musk have all the money? Why shouldn't God's people, those people that have surrendered their life and their heart and everything over to God to become a steward of God? Why can't you be a blessing? Why can't you? Remember, I, I believe that financially this, God doesn't care how much money you have just as long as what you have doesn't have you. You might be sitting there saying, well, I'm, I've got that attitude. I'm doing pretty fine. <laughs> You'll have to answer one day for it, but, but there's no telling what you actually could be today. There's no telling how wealthy you could be if you would surrender it all over to God, if you would just find some closet time. As Abraham walked with God, he said, just, just choose where you're going to go. Choose where you're going to go. Whatever your feet step on, I'm going to give it to you. That's yours to have. Abraham had a lot of time talking with God. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 that you and I, we need to find a closet of prayer. Amen. To get us lined up with God. We got to have closet time. The musicians come if you'd stand with me today. I gave to you what God gave me today. We need, to have a, we need to have some altar time right now. We need to have some altar time. We need, amen, to begin it right here. We need to begin that, 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 new, that new walk. We need to begin that new journey. We need to take that step of faith right now. It, it, it can't wait. It cannot wait. If God has spoken to you in one way or the other today, I'm asking you to come forward and come to this altar and get a hold of God today. Make me a house. Make me a house of Come on, somebody, respond to God. Don't sit on God. Take that first step of trust. That first step of faith today. Make me a house of prayer. Come on. Come on. Come on. God's asking you to take a move. God, I want to be a steward. God, I want to be a steward. I'm going to let my hands off of all of it, God. I don't own it. I'm a steward of God. In the name of Jesus Christ, I plead the blood right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray to God. You can begin to break the chains that bind. Break the chains and bind us, oh God, in the name of Jesus. In the fire of my altar, I'm going to go to Rama City, Ramando, Rama City, 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 has asked make me sacrifices a house of us. Of prayer, he has asked us to sacrifice. And we need to be like Lord, Abraham and willfully, obediently. Make me a house step into that.
that realm of faith. Make me a house and trust of God prayer. for the miracle. In the name of Jesus Christ. When my God promises, he keeps his promises. Lord, make me a house. Make me a house of prayer. A house of prayer. have a relationship with you like never before. We're going to have some closet time, oh God. make me a house. Make me a house of bread. I'm asking God to do whatever he has to do. To your family. To awaken and shake you. God, whatever it takes to wake us up. Whatever it takes to shake us. To get us where we need as a church to be, to grow. To be a light. To be a witness. Lord, Testify. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes for every person in here. Make whatever it takes. See our loved ones say. Whatever it takes to see our family and our friends say. Whatever it takes to change my faith, God. May the fire whatever of my takes, altar God. never burn We're closer out. to the rapture the than we've ever been. We are closer to the rapture out. than we've ever May been. The fire of my altar never burn out. Turn off Make the Wi-Fi. Make me a house of bread. May the fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. May the fire of my altar never burn out. In the name of the Lord. Make me a house of In the name of Jesus. I want to be the man of my home. I want to be the priest of my house. Make me a house of prayer. God, I want to be the man that when God's voice comes forward, I say, here I am. your 
presence in this place today, God. We do not take your presence for granted. Calvary was enough, but you gave us your spirit. You allow us to actually feel you. Thank you, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I just want to thank everyone for your continued commitment to Hope City Church. You know, we could we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you, right? We are the body of Christ. We are the church. You and I together, corporately, make up the church. Think about that. Everyone in here is an integral part of the body of Christ. And some people, I know pastors preach this before, but some people get real upset that they're the pinky toe. Well, let me tell you what. Have you ever hurt your pinky toe? I broke my little finger a few years ago in, 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 a, in, an, in an accident. I fell backward and caught myself like this and broke my pinky. And it was so swollen, I didn't realize it was broken until after the swelling went down and my bone reset. And so that's a constant <laughs> reminder to me. That may not seem like a real big deal to you, but I don't like having a crooked pinky. So I said all that just to say is that it doesn't matter if you're the little toe if you're the pinky finger on the left hand, it doesn't matter. You, you matter. You count. Because guess what? If I was missing my pinky toe and my second toe on one foot and my big toe on the other foot, what do you think is going to happen to my whole being? I'm going to topple over. I'm not going to have the appropriate amount of balance in my life. Everyone in here is significant. I really feel impressed to make that known today that you are significant. You matter to me. You matter to your pastor. The enemy would like for us to believe that we are insignificant, that we're not important, that we're not needed. But everyone in here is important and needed. I'm so excited about the changes that we have already made in our church. I'm so excited about our church culture. I'm so excited that all of you are excited. We are living in the last days, and we get to be a part of seeing souls come home to the kingdom of God for all of eternity. And I love that. And so right now, if you want to, you get the opportunity to be in First Steps. Our First Steps class is an amazing energizing class that you can go to and find out more about Hope City Church, our vision I'm sorry, what did I say? First Steps class and um, you find out more about Hope City Church but also the purpose for your life, right? We're here to help you navigate and figure out okay, what am I? Am I the arm? Am I the pinky toe? Am I the big toe? What am I? It's, it's fun. It's exciting. You get to take a personality and spiritual gifts survey in one of the classes. That's always really interesting. So far, they've all been straight on to everyone that's taken them, which is super exciting. It's kind of neat to figure all of that out. So we're here for you. We're here to help you figure out what it is that you need to be doing for God. So our first steps class today, Pastor will be teaching the first class. That's going to be back here to the back over to my right where the big sign is that says First Steps. We also have some people here holding up signs to help navigate that for you. There's refreshments that are free to you in there. There's coffee, sodas. Feel free to enjoy those refreshments and enjoy the company of one another. Thank you so much for attending service today. I hope that you're leaving with a little bit more of Jesus today. And you know that you're loved. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.